And it looks like we're ready to go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Dunlop. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation here at GPRC. I had a quick look through the attendee list and it looks like a lot of familiar names and a lot of unfamiliar names. So we've got a great crowd here today, a really, really interesting audience. And uh, forgive me for, for not uh, being able to give shout outs to everyone in the audience because it's, it's a pretty large group today. So anyway, I'm the moderator for today's event and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, just a, a few little things before we get started. We're in the Zoom format. Some of you maybe with low bandwidth might find that uh, it uh, adjusting your, your settings might let things come through a little bit better. We're not gonna put uh, any kind of participant pictures on screen, so that should be okay there. Uh, there sh should be a image of, in front of you. Uh, hopefully that works uh, because we're gonna have some presentations with, with pictures. So. Uh, we have a very diverse audience, like I was saying, I had a quick run through the, the list there, and we hope our talk today has something for everyone. Uh, we realize that, that diversity, there's going to be people coming with a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different interests, and we're going to do our best to try to cover those things. For the people who are on Mountain Standard Time, thanks for giving up your lunch hour for this. We really appreciate that. And now I'd like to just introduce our very esteemed panel in front of us. And so... I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Kathy Hickson, uh, Chief Geologist of Terrapin Geothermics. Uh, Dr. Hickson is one of the most experienced, knowledgeable, and as a former geography instructor, I can say one of the more eminent geologists in, in Canada. I, I used to refer to her work quite a bit in my teaching, so it's, I'm just delighted she's here today. Uh, she's uh, been involved in geothermal energy research and innovation for much of her career, uh, almost four decades as a geologist. She's an accomplished administrator, senior executive with extensive expertise in geothermal exploration, well field exploration and expansion, well testing and reservoir management. She also has extensive experience in scientific and technical management, community and government relations and risk analysis. Welcome, Kathy. We also have with us uh, Mark Columbina, Vice President of Operations for Terrapin Geothermics. Uh, Mark oversees the management, logistics, and procurement for Terrapin, including the Alberta number one geothermal project here in our region. He's also highly involved in strategic planning, conducting all project management activities. Along with his project and resource management roles, Mark maintains Terrapin's relationships with federal and provincial government departments and agencies. Some of you may have met him that way. And he's also works a lot with non-governmental organizations. And our third esteemed panelist, Dr. Bob Murray, as we know him, President and CEO of Grand Prairie Regional College, my boss. Uh, in his first year at GPRC, Dr. Murray's repositioned the institution as an innovative student-centered and future-focused institution. Uh, in addition to his role at GPRC, which he's, um, he's also got leadership roles as Vice Chair of the Advocacy and Stakeholder Relations um, for the Council of Post-Secondary Presidents of Alberta, COPOA. And he's also chair of the Alberta College's Economic Recovery Task Force, which has produced a lot of good work going into the, the system review. Um, he's in the spring of 2020, Bob was appointed to the Guiding Coalition, overseeing the government of Alberta's Alberta 2030, building skills for jobs, system-wide review, as I was just referring to. And uh, he also serves, although I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, he serves as chair of the government of Manitoba's working group for the Winnipeg Metro region. As a former Manitoban, I'm gonna leave that one alone. Uh, so welcome to our panel, and, and thanks very much for being here. Um, the format of the discussion is going to be as follows for our audience. I, I'm going to first ask each panelist to lead us off in a few minutes. I'm going to ask them to lead us off with a brief comment, and I, I believe they all have some pictures to share of that. Hopefully it all works. Um, following those open comments, I'm going to ask some pre-selected questions. We had some uh, really interesting, really uh, thought-provoking questions come in with the registrations. We've tried to assemble those into some major categories that I'm going to actually uh, put in turn to each of the panelists. And then after we do those uh, questions in turn, uh, the pre-selected questions will move on to our open session, which I'm sure you're, you're looking forward to. I do have to apologize in advance. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a lot of interesting questions submitted. We're probably not going to have time to cover all the things that people have on their minds. Um, we'll do our best uh, we, uh, to, to cover the major areas and, uh, of course, we'll give you options for follow-up if we run out of time before all the questions are answered. Uh, just before I actually ask the panelists to um, get into their opening presentations, I just want to make a, a couple of personal comments. Uh, this is really interesting for me to be part of 
as a research director, um, I'm really pleased to be part of this today. As I'm sure Bob will speak more to, this is an important step for GPRC's involvement in the broader energy conversation for our region, for Alberta. Uh, I'm reminded with this talk of about exactly four years ago on a bright sunny spring day, it looked a lot like today in Grand Prairie, a lot like what's behind Bob, just 30 degrees warmer. Uh, we were in Peace River. There was a, a Northern Alberta Development Council called together a conference called Energizing the North. And I suspect a lot of you in the virtual room today have, uh, were in attendance at that event. And you may remember Scott Andrews of the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association and Rob Mackin, who's now a Beaumont, but at the time was mayor of Hinton. They kicked off the Energizing the North with a panel discussion on geothermal energy. And it's interesting how we've come from that point now. And, and so not long after that event, Bob invited GPRC to be part of conversations around geothermal. And as research director, I've had a, the chance to attend a lot of really interesting meetings over the last couple of years with some of the great people in the region who have really uh, put a lot of interest in there. And I'm sure today is just for them too, just uh, just that milestone moment. So I'm, I'm thinking of people like Michelle Gardner, Re Rebecca Lee, Bill Given, just of City of Grand Prairie. Bill's now moved to Jasper. Uh, Dooley Nelson and Rob Mackin, as I mentioned, from Hinton. Kevin Keller from Greenview. Chris King from the county. Peggy Sargent from Fairview. Larry Gibson, Bob Hall, many others who have been part of these conversations. This is like, like me, if you're on the call today, you're going to find this really exciting. So I've learned a lot about the potential for geothermal energy in a region from those of you who's also talking to Mark and Kathy recently, and I, I think we're much closer to where realizing some of those, those great outcomes that we've talked about. And with Alberta One right around the corner, right in front of us, it's an ex and uh, GPRC's exciting new training and innovation priorities on paper now that I think Bob will talk about. I, I think we're in a really exciting place. So uh, I anyway, you didn't come here to hear me talk. Um, you came here to learn more about geothermal, so I think we should dive right in. I'm going to ask uh, Kathy to give us her her opening presentation. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Actually, I'm going to pass this over to Mark uh, to uh, to kick off and give us an introduction um, about uh, about Terrapin. But thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it, Kathy and Andrew. And just uh, following through on some of the interesting piece, I'm happy to be here today presenting uh, with GPRC. So a few years ago, I presented up in the Grand Prairie area before Alberta number one was able to be announced um, due to the federal funding. And so Andrew, I believe, was at that presentation. And so, yeah, it's just quite exciting to be able to continue down that path uh, these days. So Diane, if you want to take it to the next slide. Yeah, so I guess get into Terrapin and then we'll get into the geothermal activity. So Terrapin uh, we're a waste heat to power and geothermal energy company founded in late 2016 uh, with the idea to develop and commercialize a technology to produce electricity from low grade sources of thermal energy, particularly suspended oil and gas wells. Uh, we believe that the market timing of that venture was ideal when, as when we were founded, uh, the newly installed Alberta government had mandated a retirement of coal facilities. Uh, they a shift to uh, capacity market, and then uh, increased renewable energy capacity requirements. And so this was matched with the federal mandate towards a price on carbon. So the technology we were looking to develop would, have, would be an emission-free baseload distributed electrical generation source uh, that would act as a valuable asset to support this transition away from coal and to more renewable energy. Uh, Terrapin, we believed at the time that Alberta, and still believe that Alberta had all the ingredients to make the vent this venture work. Existing sources of low-grade heat from those wells, a legislative push towards decarbonization, and the existing skill set of Albertan workers to complete all the required engineering, manufacturing, installation, and maintenance, and operations of that power equipment in Alberta. We wouldn't have to source from outside. And that has always been a major mandate of Terrapin is train in Alberta, develop in Alberta, and do as much as we can within Alberta. So with Terrapin being a proudly Albertan company, we were focused on this made in Alberta solution to uh, rapidly changing global landscape. 
as we went through the tech development process, uh, a significant number of regulatory and development hurdles uh, were identified that really pushed the horizon on that tech development and the commercial feasibility. However, it didn't really change our belief that there was a push for decarbonization in the province as a whole, and that that push to decarbonization was gonna affect traditional industries that were the driver of Alberta's economy. Our, I guess, product market fit investigation had shown that Alberta not only had sources of low grade heat, but also had significant volumes of low temperature heat from geothermal generally, as well as higher temperature waste heat through the industrial facilities. And so Terrapin decided to shift to focus on heat generally as an untapped resource in the province that uh, a focus on heat could help support efforts to reduce emissions intensity in the province. By the focus on uh, these more commercially ready projects rather than the tech development, we could, Terrapin could support traditional industries uh, and trades to help thrive in this transition towards a net zero future. Uh, and then on the geothermal side, a focus on low temperature geothermal uses brought us in contact with a number of mun municipalities, particularly the County of Grand Prairie and the MD of Greenview, who both led some investigations into ways to diversify their energy mixes. It was these municipalities really taking the lead and looking to lead in Alberta's energy transition. And so that kind of brings us to where we are today and what we're talking about today, geothermal energy and the Alberta number one project. So Diane, if you could skip ahead, that'd be great. So, I mean, just the nuts and bolts of it. What is the project? What are we talking about? Uh, the Alberta number one project is the development of the first conventional geothermal electricity and thermal energy facility in the province. And one of the first of a handful in Canada. Uh, it's a, for anybody on the, more power market side. It's a five megawatt net, eight megawatt gross uh, facility with an associated district energy network uh, following behind. And it's being developed uh, just outside of Grovedale actually. So relatively south, a little bit across the border from Gr County of Grand Prairie, but hopefully nobody holds that against us during this presentation. So uh, the project's supported by a grant from Natural Resources Canada's Emerging Renewable Power Program, a program which was designed to bring globally commercialized electrical generation technologies to Canada for their initial installations. Um, so Alberta number one will really be the proving ground for conventional geothermal energy in Alberta, both electrical generation, but also thermal generation and direct geothermal energy use. Um, through the development of this facility, we're testing the vast amounts of subsurface data that we have collected in this province during hydrocarbon and mineral exploration for its applicability to geothermal energy development. As well, through connections to local manufacturing and agro-industrial development, the project will be showing the viability of geothermal heat for direct heat use, uh, supplementing the current use of natural gas. Terrapin's developing the project. Like I said before, we're building a team of Albertans who have expertise in the hydrocarbon and mineral extraction sectors and putting those skills to use for development of a new complementary industry within the province. Uh, we hope that this project will be the first in many geothermal projects in Alberta that will allow Alberta to diversify and thrive in a lower carbon world. It's not to say that geothermal energy will be the replacement for oil and gas or any hydrocarbons, as Kathy will speak to in the next slide when I kick it over to her. But we do see geothermal energy as a key component in a rational energy mix moving forward for the province. And so on that, uh, Kathy, I'll kick it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. So I don't intend to give you Geothermal 101 in the next couple of minutes, but uh, what I want to do is just highlight, you know, essentially segue from, from Mark's uh, points. And one is that geothermal very much is complementary. I mean, 
those of you who live in a Grand Prairie, I mean, you know, are in many parts of Alberta that, you know, your town is surrounded by fields of well field equipment. Uh, you've got many of you who are on farms have wells, uh, you know, within the, the boundaries of your farm. So you know how important the oil and gas industry is to Alberta. So what we want to do is really complement that. Those wells are actually pumping hot water. And those of you who are in the industry probably know this. In fact, excess heat is a, is a problem in many cases because it has an impact actually on, uh, on the production of the oil and gas. And some wells actually need to have coolers on them. So why don't we put that, that material, which is already being pumped to use? And that's really what we're trying to do. So Alberta does have an amazing re resource. There's, um, uh, so we, we account for the electrical potential a little bit differently than the thermal potential. But you know, there's several hundreds of megawatts of power potential, but, but even more, thousands of megawatts of thermal potential available. Next. So nuts and bolts of it is we're doing exactly what you do in the oil and gas industry. We use that same technology. We use the same equipment. Uh, we are drilling deep into the subsurface, extracting that hot fluid. But in our case, in the in geothermal, basically we're going deeper than you might want to go for oil and gas. We're going deeper because if we want to make power, we, we need higher temperatures. And so those higher temperatures are only found very deep within the basin. We bring it to the surface, it goes through a power plant or heat exchanger, and then is distributed to, to local industry if we're talking about direct heat or homes. It just depends on the individual location. At our location, south of Grand Prairie there near Grovedale, there is a light industrial park under development. And we hope to be able to be feeding that light industrial park with green power and green heat in the foreseeable future. Next. But what I want to emphasize, so one of the things about power production is we need high temperatures. And those high temperatures in the Alberta context are not so high. They're about 120 degrees centigrade. But what we can do with lower temperature fluids is amazing. And what you see here in this diagram is basically in Alberta, and you know it's very, very cold there today. Um, and even here in Burnaby, where I live now, there uh, we're minus six. And for us, that's pretty darn cold. And what you see there is that space heating is the single largest energy um, expenditure that we have as an economy. So if we can replace that heat, which is uh, basically we can replace the, the natural gas with geothermal heat and essentially fill the gap um, in space heating, we can do amazing things and we can really help in this energy transition. What you can see in terms of what, what do we use thermal heat? Well, obviously we use it to heat our homes, but it has many other applications. Essentially any kind of an industrial process, many of them use heat. Um, crop drying, you've got huge, um, you know, Peace River country is an incredible area for, um, for agriculture and grain. A lot of that times every few years that grain needs to be dried. That's a huge use of thermal energy. So I want you to think about all these different uses of that thermal energy and the fact that you are already producing it to the surface. So we're just trying to transition away from, um, or not away from, we still absolutely need oil and gas, but we're trying to transition some of that heating use into geothermal. Next, and I think that's all I need to say. Next slide, yes, thank you. Over to you, Bob. Thanks very much. Um, you know, I wanna just start by saying what a great privilege it is to be here today and really for us to be part of this pivotal project for Alberta. 
Uh, not everyone gets to say that they're part of history, but as we've heard today, that's where we're headed and where we anticipate we're headed. Uh, you know, geothermal energy opportunities and more specifically Terrapins Alberta Number One project are an integral component to our collective energy future. Uh, we're all watching this space with great interest and anticipation. Geothermal is a virtually untapped area that will harness distinctly Albertan potential to deliver energy, jobs, and a brighter regional future. But the significance of GPRC and Terrapins budding partnership goes well beyond the leading edge facility that's being built in our proverbial backyard. We are intentionally creating links that we believe will far outlast the ribbon cutting in 2024. And for us, this is really about supporting all facets of discovery and excellence. At GPRC, we've doubled down on our commitment to being a driver of innovation, conveyor of fact, hub of research and center for human progress. Similar to Terrapin, we have a transformative agenda, but our focus is largely people and processes. Through our five GPRC strategy, we've identified five priorities for the next five years and we are steadily gaining momentum. GPRC is advancing a student-centered, future-focused approach with a leaner, more agile and results-oriented game plan. Not only do we want GPRC to be recognized as a leader among post-secondary institutions, we want to realize our full potential as the northern center of post-secondary excellence in Alberta. But we know that this goal simply isn't achievable without adaptability, integration, and growth. These are three things that I believe will feature prominently in our discussion today and in the months and years ahead. What we've heard quite clearly so far is that geothermal advancement holds great promise for our region in terms of long-term economic value and energy diversification. But the onus of innovation does not sit squarely on the shoulders of industry. Partnerships, research and development and commercialization instincts are all key features of most contemporary academic institutions. To that end, GPRC has continued to hone in on opportunities to improve and expand our province's distinctive energy portfolio. Whether it's woody biomass for heat generation, microalgae systems for carbon capture, or other collaborative investigations, we are eager to make a difference. For us, this research focus is an essential part of our day-to-day, -day, and even more so in an increasingly complex and competitive funding environment. However, what we've also come to understand over time is that post-secondary institutions have a necessary and growing responsibility for social innovation. A key part of our role in this region is nurturing vital connections along the learning continuum and delivering job-ready professionals who can make an impact. GPRC wants to empower results, be it the development of ideas, implementation and evaluation of solutions, or foundational knowledge and skill sets when education and industry work together, outcomes improve across the board, and GPRC is honored to be training the workforce of tomorrow. Our programming is equipping students with necessary technical expertise and applied problem-solving skills through competency-based learning. In fact, GPRC is the fourth largest provider of trades and apprenticeships in Alberta. We are helping students to gear up for success, and we are doing it by delivering a wide range of apprenticeship training along with various trades related programming. More specifically to the geothermal space, GPRC has well-recognized power engineering, electrician and instrumentational and control programs, as well as support occupations like heavy equipment, millwright and sheet metal worker programs. Not only are we helping local talent to develop, the community is retaining these long-term assets. 72% of the 2017-18 graduating class who are already located in Grand Prairie and not in the apprenticeship or university transfer stream remained in the region. Despite economic challenges across the board, our region continues to welcome graduates into meaningful employment. Approximately 92% of regional apprenticeship graduates who completed both their technical and on-the-job training were employed in 2018. Recent census data is also promising, showing an anticipated increase of 18% for water and heat supply system employment over opportunities over the next few years, as well as a 4% bump for electrical power generation pathways. And for those driven purely by earning potential, you'll see that GPRC trains students for some of the highest paying trades, including power engineering, instrumentation and control, and heavy equipment technician. Indeed, the future for our graduates is bright and the same can be said for industry. 
Since our inception in 1966, we've steadily evolved with our communities and now we're poised to offer even better support. Through 5GPRC, we are improving our adaptability and capacity to deliver more personalized pathways to learning. We are optimistic that our work over the next few years, or the last few years, I'm sorry, has been effective and anticipate that in addition to expanding trade and apprenticeship credentialing, we will also see specific degree focused programming integrated into our academic portfolio in the near future. Be it through a certificate, diploma, collaborative degree achievement or trade and apprenticeship stream, we are here for our community. This is the real world integration piece that sometimes gets overlooked in the shuffle. Through initiatives like our Workforce Advisory Council, we are able to connect regularly with industry and explore shared challenges and solutions. We're grateful to have Terrapin and Mark specifically at the table, along with many others on this webinar today. These links are helping to accelerate progress and maximize potential. We are listening carefully when our partners tell us about skill shortages and recruitment difficulties, and we are proactively taking steps to close the gaps that impede our collective progress. As long-standing hubs in Grand Prairie and Fairview, we have our finger firmly on the regional pulse. We are one of the first places to sense the grassroots excitement about new industry opportunities, as well as trepidation. In every instance, we do our best to mobilize that enthusiasm, put fears to rest, and support continuous improvement. GPRC is privileged to lay a foundation of contemporary skills that will be directly applicable in a rapidly transforming world of work. Ideally, it's these hands-on experiences that we provide that will help make things tangible and light that internal fire across our region. We want our students to be part of an inspired future. The enthusiasm and excitement they bring to a workplace generally translates into exceptional results for many years to come. GPRC is bringing change to life with experiential training and learning mechanisms as well as relevant content. So before shovels go in the ground at Terrapins Alberta number one, we will be supporting construction and trades teams who will require oh &S training and upskilling for their on-site activity. We understand the vital role of safety in the operations across our region and we're proud to do our part. Ultimately, the shift to renewable energy sources is exciting but complex. As we see it, in addition to training next generation professionals, we also have an important commitment to working with industry veterans to evolve their skill sets as they continue to carve out their role in the changing energy landscape. This is about working collaboratively with all of our valued industry partners on shared potential and new solutions that optimize our remarkable regional assets. And today's a great start. So on that note, I'm happy to hand it over to Andrew to get our discussion going. Uh, thanks very much to all of you. Um, so I, I do have some pre-selected questions that uh, I'm, I'm going to hit you with first. And uh, I do know some of the questions are coming in in the question and answer box. Uh, keep those coming for when we get into our open session. Um, so I'm going to direct this actually to each of you. and, and uh, um, I want you to think about this. I took another quick scan through the participant list and I see we have a lot of representation from our regional municipalities, uh, not just in the Grand Prairie area, but, but quite a bit further uh, out as well. And, I, and that probably doesn't surprise you. And I, I suspect a question on a lot of the binds of people coming from those uh, municipal government organizations or, or just generally, I think anyone in the audience is probably wondering around uh, geothermal, how it fits in within uh, Alberta's energy and economic diversification future. And Mark, if I could ask you to maybe give us an answer on that one. Yeah, start us off. yeah absolutely, Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, the role geothermal energy can play in Alberta's energy and economic diversification, well, one of the biggest pieces right now is the utilization of the resources we have in this province for their most valuable purpose, I guess. So currently we burn a, we burn natural gas, a lot of natural gas for heating, right? Well, we have a geothermal energy that I always get in trouble when I say it flippantly that uh, you can't export heat, uh, even though you can export products of natural gas. So, so fully understanding that you can convert geothermal heat into uh, you know, green hydrogen. There is potential on that side, but um, it's really geothermal energy allowing other 
I guess, hydrocarbon resources and energy resources being to be utilized for what they're best for. So geothermal energy is a base load, um, a base load source of electrical power and of heat. So as we transition to more renewable energy in the province, uh, solar, wind, you know, more sources of baseload energy are required to match the intermittency added by those other renewable sources, all of which are required to help us decarbonize in the province. And so geothermal energy can be a supplement on that side. As well on the heat, truthfully, I mean, if there is potential for a large LNG export um, in the near future, as well as the conversion of natural gas into its various component products, geothermal heat can help supplement that, uh, that transition away from simply just combusting some natural gas for heating. So that's one area I would say that geothermal energy can play a role in the province. And maybe kick it over to Kathy as well. I was, I was going to just ask Kathy, uh, I know she's, uh, I've had some really in interesting couple of discussions with Kathy about energy transition. And I wondered if you wanted to maybe direct it in that direction for diversification. Yes, so one of the things about geothermal is that, and I wanna emphasize as Mark has already has, geothermal is not a replacement for oil and gas. There are so many, um, uses for petroleum products that you can't get any other way. So, so geothermal is a way to help us get off of coal-fired generation, so high, high emitting GHG. So we can transition by the using geothermal in replacement of coal, and we can also use it to basically help us transition a little bit away from from oil and gas, and particularly to make sure that we have those oil and gas products for the products that in fact they are best used for. It, they're not efficient for, for strictly heat. So let's use them as gasoline in uh, vehicles and, and the things which they are so superbly um, essentially created for. Thanks, thanks very much, Kathy. Uh, Bob, I know you sit on, uh, in, your, in, the, in my introduction to you, uh, you mentioned the panels that you sit on that, uh, I mean, at their essence, they'd look at these big questions of uh, the economic future of the province, or in one case, another province. Uh, do you have any thoughts specific to that on uh, uh, geothermal's place in, in diversification? I think one of the things that we know quite clearly is that successive Alberta governments uh, have been looking at what diversification can mean and how it is that we can start investing meaningfully and approaching diversification in a way that's going to yield the results that we want to be looking for. And so I think this is a really great opportunity. And I think it also shows the potential not only on the energy front, but on the economic front. We, we see a project like Alberta number one bringing good paying jobs to the area. It's certainly the partnership with post-secondary and the opportunity to address talent shortages uh, as well and our opportunity to help recruit and retain skilled workers in our region. So there's a number of spin-off positives that come out of thinking this way. Uh, and I think that certainly in the approach that Terrapin has been taking, this certainly would assist the government of Alberta and really across Canada in thinking about what our ongoing energy diversification can look like. Thanks very much. So now I'm going to put uh, each of you on the spot with a very specific question I think relates to uh, your, your own uh, particular expertise. And so I'm going to come full circle back to you, Mark. Um, just thinking of, from your opening uh, comments, uh, you talked about an Alberta focused a lot. And, and obviously, it got me thinking, you've obviously made a really considered choice to start in the Northwest with uh, Alberta number one. And so I guess my question for you is uh, what makes a region I guess generally, but more specifically, I think for a lot of our audience, what makes Northwest Alberta a really good fit for economically viable geothermal development? Yeah, Andrew, um, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the first things is we're an Alberta company. I'm in Alberta. Our whole team is in Alberta. And so we wanted to do this in Alberta. So our focus right away was the Alberta market. Um, and I think what makes 
Northwestern Alberta, a good fit for geothermal energy is really, I guess, a confluence of geology and surface installations. And so I'm going to say a very few light things on the geology that, uh, so that I'm not being fully into Kathy's space where I'm don't I'm out of my depth, um, but a few pieces. So in Northwestern Alberta, there's an extensive drilling history into uh, permeable formations. So we have some information. Now that information helps us to target uh, potential formations for geothermal activity and helps reduce some of the exploration risk on the front end. It's not wholly done for geothermal. And like I said earlier, uh, that's part of the job of the technical team right now is how can we adapt that knowledge to be applicable for geothermal energy going forward uh, in the province, but it does help. Um, as well in the Northwest of the province, uh, because in Alberta, our heat is simply, the ge to hit the geothermal heat, we essentially just follow our geothermal gradient. So the deeper we get, the hotter we are essentially. And so the sedimentary basin actually slopes in the province. And so we can actually hit depths uh, to hit, or hit uh, 120 degrees Celsius fluid in the Northwest of the province. Um, so that's kind of on one side. On the other side and the, the surface side, which makes a huge difference is we have potential heat loads in Northwestern Alberta. So one of the reasons we targeted in the MD of Greenview and just south of the Grand Prairie area is that in development light industrial park and existing facilities, because in Alberta, in our deregulated market, the price of power is quite low. And so to really make commercially viable geothermal, we're selling both heat and power. And so we needed to be located within economic distance of potential heat offtake facilities or areas where those facilities could be developed. And so the development of these areas, both the Greenview Industrial Gateway, uh, further south of where we are, and Light Industrial Park in Grovedale, that really helps make an economic project. As well, we're close to electrical infrastructure. I mean, it's great to want to put a geothermal project kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but how are you going to transport the electricity from somewhere? Building out transmission lines and distribution lines can get quite expensive. And so in that Grand Prairie area in the Northwest region, there's at least enough build out of electrical infrastructure for us to export our products. Um, then another piece, significant amounts of disturbed and built infrastructure in the area. I mean, oil and gas companies have done a ton of drilling, a ton of exploration, and something that's super helpful for these early geothermal projects is the ability to utilize existing sites, to drill off existing well pads, um, to not have to always repermit and develop new sites um, is a huge benefit in the area. And then finally, I guess, um, transportation. Um, so the Canamex trade corridor, as people already know about, I mean, there's rail, there's significant highway, and I mean, even more significant highway with the twinning of Highway 40 in the area to actually both get our required casing, our different equipment to site, and also um, get people to site, get um, any associated industry, if it's greenhousing, if it's anything else, the ability to transport those products out to their end users. And so it's kind of the confluence of those things that makes Northwestern Alberta a good fit for geothermal. Thanks, Mark. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy because, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that out of your depth comment is the last geothermal pun we have in this session, but uh, Kathy, you probably expect me to ask you something around uh, uh, depth of wells or something, and I think we even have a question in the in the in the window here about that. But I was going to ask you more, maybe in a little diff different direction, knowing your your extensive experience. Um, you talked in your opener about the, and as Mark just did too, about that ability to reuse oil and gas well sites, for example. But there's a lot of technologies and methods that are 
transferable from oil and gas. And uh, with that in mind, what are some of the geoscience opportunities maybe now and for the next five years uh, that you see developing? Can you talk about uh, maybe some of the different disciplines that you've seen that uh, that you can foresee people working in and how people working in those existing fields can transfer over into and integrate in geothermal? Great, great questions. And I've been busily um, typing away at some answers here. And certainly the suspended well, orphan well issue is, is uh, there's a couple of questions on that. So I'll just quickly. So the, there are many hurdles to using existing suspended gas and oil wells. And one of the differences is that most gas and oil wells are actually a very small diameter. And that small diameter, we just can't pump the kinds of fluids to the surface that we need to in fact be useful. So it's a problem for oil and gas, but unfortunately it is not enough that comes to the surface. So there's a whole you know, a whole bunch of research that has been going into the use of suspended wells. But to get back to your other part of your question, is anybody in terms of geology or geophysics that is currently in the oil industry, those skills are absolutely bang on for what we need in geothermal. We need to understand the deep subsurface. We need to understand the permeability and the porosity of those units. So we get a lot of that information from already drilled wells. And of course the geologists and geoscientists and geophysicists that look at that data. So anybody who, who is you know, currently on a geological track or a geophysical track is on track to use those skills in in the geothermal industry. So I would just say, you know, stay focused. Um, one of the things that you don't get much experience with in Alberta as a geologist is of course volcanic systems. And um, because they are quite different than the sedimentary systems, but the good thing is these sedimentary systems like we have the Western Canada sedimentary basin um, are the largest and most extensive geothermal systems in the world. So even if you, um, um, well, you are more likely to be hired in a uh, development project in a sedimentary basin than you are in a volcanic system because they're just much more restricted. Does that an answer for you? Yeah, it, it does. And, it, and, and I think it gives me a bit of a transition to the next question I was going to direct Bob's way, which is, uh, um, Bob talked about the, the sort of transformative agenda for our, our college here in Grand Prairie, but uh, with his connection in through system wide through Alberta, I, I, I expect he has some insight into this is that uh, uh, how can academic institutions, and not necessarily just ours, but uh, any uh, within the system, uh, what can they do now and, and into the future to be active participants in this, this um, the transitions that Kathy was just talking about? Yeah, I, before I tackle that question, just back to, to Mark's answer, I actually think what makes Northwestern Alberta ideal is the proximity to GPRC. That's really all Mark had to say, but uh, his answer was good. <laughs> um, but one thing I think it's important to understand is that there's certainly going to, there's not gonna be a cookie cutter approach. There's no one size fits all. And we would see that varying significantly uh, throughout institutions, depending on strength, the focus and drivers of change at an institution, and also the, the sector or type of institution we're talking about. Universities, polytechnics, and colleges would approach this quite differently. But I think in, in general, academia has to demonstrate an institutional commitment to social innovation. And in general, I think we do this by modeling best practices on our campuses, facilitating uh, relevant research and commercialization opportunities and maximizing opportunities for students to be engaged in energy transition. And one of the other things that we know is, you know, mutually beneficial industry partnerships are central to our approach at GPRC because they create innovative career channels, they spark student interest, and they also fuel discovery and drive research. So when education and industry work in sync, outcomes improve across the board. And we know that transformation is challenging at the best of times, let alone in the midst of one of the most pronounced economic contractions our region has ever faced and in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, but the only way we're gonna come out of this in a better position is if we work together. 
And to that end, we believe, and I would say that cross-sectoral partnerships are key. Uh, you know, our post-secondary institutions have the privilege and responsibility of training the workforce of tomorrow. So basic due diligence means we're delivering contemporary programming that reflects market needs. And the fast rise of any innovative area requires a level of awareness, adaptability, and resourcefulness. So any shift in energy technology will challenge us to reshape our approach and skill sets. So as we see it in this conversation, you know, GPRC's role specifically would be to build a sturdy knowledge and skill foundation, to provide relevant technical training, to spark interest with experiential teaching and learning mechanisms, to cultivate applied problem solving and research skills, and to accelerate and help scale up the necessary components to make all of this work. But I think most importantly, we're at the grassroots level where a small spark of interest can be intentionally grown into a lasting community resource and to help really solidify a sector or market in a particular industry. So at GPRC, we're committed to fueling excitement about change and delivering job-ready professionals who can excel in any environment. And I think all of those pieces and all of those values are directly applicable to the conversation we're having here. Oh, I, I might be a little biased, but I think I agree with a lot of that, sitting in a college in Northwest Alberta. So uh, I, uh, that was the, the, the extent of the pre-selected questions that uh, we, we built off of what people had submitted um, when they registered. And I've been following the question and answer box here, and I've noticed that some of you have been typing furiously, impressively furiously, to, uh, to answer a lot of these questions. But I thought it would be worth maybe revisiting just for a bit of context. Uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed that you're able to kind of hammer out those quick answers, but, but uh, I think uh, maybe if we could talk about them, and, and perhaps not everyone's had the chance to, to read along with this. And um, one of the ones I was just thought I might go back to, and Mark, you had provided a bit of an answer, but uh, uh, hang on a minute here. Uh, and this is a question from Greg asking about the the large potential or the large difference between thermal and electrical potential quoted for Alberta. And he'd asked some follow-ups about conversion efficiency. Um, and, and I wondered, Mark, if you could just expand on this, because I know that's a question I've heard from uh, some of the technical people that I've talked to in, in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, one of the biggest pieces when we're presenting the thermal energy potential of the province versus the electrical generation potential um, is that we, to, uh, to deliver the electrical generation potential, we need to hit about 120 degrees Celsius for fluid temperature, and then have that at about 300 liters a second of fluid. And so it's a significant volume at a significant temperature to produce electrical energy. So that requires drilling quite deep and it requires large well bores and it requires permeable reservoirs. And so it is a lower potential than the heat, the thermal potential because as we all know, I mean, you know, minus, minus 50 is not necessarily the general temperature in the province, but I believe the mean annual temperature in Grand Prairie is about six degrees. And so there is a vast amount of fluid hotter than six degrees and less than 120 degrees centigrade, right? And so the utilization for that of that fluid for low temperature heat uses, for space heating, for water heating, for drying purposes in various industries, that's where the thermal energy potential comes from. And so it's really just that the electrical potential would be a smaller, a very small subset of the overall geothermal potential of the province. So, Andrew, if I can also just add to that, I think what, what is important, and somebody just asked the question about, you know, how deep is quite deep? <laughs> and how does this compare to, to oil and gas? So, so I'm just going to segue from, from Mark's answer is that, so one of the things that you've heard him say is this 300 liters per second to produce eight megawatts of power at 120 degrees C. So any of your industry people who are, are listening will know that is a lot. 
to ask for. And it also plays into the use of suspended wells. So typically a well will produce about maybe five liters, 10 liters, 15 liters per second. So we're talking about a current um, oil and gas well. Now, most of those wells are actually formation limited. And what that means is that that well bore is so small and the pump we put into it, we can't get any more fluid out of it. And at those volumes of fluid, it's not terribly useful. If that well happened to be built beside a sports complex or a new development, it's possible that those, those small diameter wells might be able to produce enough heat in order to, in fact, say heat a facility. But what we're trying to do with, with power is produce vast quantities of heat, but that's also expensive because those wells are deep and by quite deep, what we mean is they're going to be more than 3,500 meters. Um, this is deeper than most oil wells, unless you're south um, and west uh, of Edmonton, then they are deeper. But the price to drill those really deep wells at, four, say, say more than 4,500 meters to get that, the hot fluids is, is just, it just doesn't make um, economic sense. So we have to have an area that is um, shallow enough, but yet deep enough in order to get those temperatures. And then back to our suspended wells. So what we, our well diameters are large enough that they are not well bore limited. So what we're saying, what we mean by that is that we want wells that are big enough that we can pump 100 liters per second. And, uh, and that is what we need to pump in order to be commercial. However, what I want to emphasize is that's for power production. We need or we can use much lower temperatures and less fluid for direct use. So that's just another reason. It's all about economics. We're cold, we need heat. We can get heat at shallower levels, 2,500 meters, something like that. We can get between, between 40 and 90 degrees C. And that is, is sufficient temperatures that we can make those kinds of developments commercial. I think, Kathy, a lot of what you're talking about is probably on the minds of, of many of our audience members. And I, I was just going to take a, a bit of a step back. There's a, a question that came through in a, in, through another way, and it was, uh, and uh, I'm not as surprised at all to see it. And it, it's, I, I suspect, um, and Mark, I, I also, before I, I, meant, I asked the question, and I'll put it to any of you um, when I do, but Mark, you had, had answered another question in, in the question and answer box around, um, uh, kind of the, the the options for application and, and the different kind of businesses and so on that uh, could could make use of this this these heat sources and so the question I'm asking um, and like I say I'm not at all surprised because I've seen the audience list is what role do you see local municipalities playing in energy diversification so what's the municipal role what do they have to do and and I, I I'm kind of asking this from a perspective of uh, watching a, a couple of municipalities um, sort of uh, take a closer look at this and, and uh, some of the questions they have around applications and costs, things that Kathy was talking about. Yeah, so I mean, municipalities have a huge potential to be the drivers of these change. So I mean, the Alberta number one project specifically occurred because the MD of Greenview and their councillors we're looking for diversification opportunities um, for their energy mix. And so they bit the bullet and did some studies into geothermal potential within the MD of Greenview. And the County of Grand Prairie has also done potential. And so MDs, municipalities, governments, they can take a longer term view as to what is most beneficial for our constituents, uh, our residents moving forward. And so they can drive the early stages of development and the early stages of understanding um, 
The other piece that municipalities have a huge potential for is the ability to plan for the future. Um, so one of the big things that we hear about a lot of times with geothermal is, oh, it would be great. We can do building heating. We can do a number of other things. It's always easier to do that in the planning stage than it is to, as anybody who lives in Alberta with construction understands how much of a pain to rip up roads and, you know, do crossings at a bunch of places and you know, how that can be solved by the municipalities planning early to say, is there an option to do geothermal heating in this area? Well, when we're laying down our piping, when we're doing new fiber optic cables in the area, can we trench, do another trench at the same time and lay dish or teat piping in? It's kind of those decisions that municipalities can make that can drive industries forward. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, that's, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, Andy, oh, sorry. I just, just wanted, no, I just wanted to say one thing. So one of the things that I have said to the province is so government of the province of Alberta is to think about geothermal as, as infrastructure, heat as infrastructure. So just the way we talk about laying pipes for telephone and, and sewer and whatnot, we need to think about it, laying pipes for heat. And just Andrew, if I can jump in and, and just build on Mark's comment. I mean, I think it's important to understand that municipalities are really where rubber hits the road on economic development of any kind. And so being intentional about decisions around energy diversification as part of a local and ideally regional uh, economic development plan uh, can have significant impact on how uh, companies and industry actually approach looking at these projects in the future. Uh, municipalities can be huge enablers of economic success and energy diversification, but they can also be barriers to that if they haven't considered creating the most competitive environment possible and taking into account what it's going to take and act to actually enable the kind of investment and growth that they might be trying to target. So I think they can be significant partners and they, they have to be significant partners if energy diversification is gonna work moving forward. And we know that in our region that the energy sector and the energy support sector are significant parts of the, the regional economy. And we've seen our municipalities take that very seriously and work to make the environment more competitive. So I think there are some real assets in our region that can certainly speak and inform others uh, as they try to make those plans. Yeah, those are great answers all. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I think we have time to slip one more question in. Um, and I'm going to go off uh, the question box again. Uh, I, I didn't introduce my own background, but as I think I mentioned that I used to teach geography, so I have to ask this question from Perry. It's probably to you, Kathy. Uh, he says, great discussion. I have a question about the effects of topography on the distribution of heat transfer. Uh, especially in areas of large elevation changes. And I do know, I, you probably are, um, know too, um, the situation in town of Hinton encountered with that, that very problem. So I'm going to end on a technical question of my own choosing here. I'll take the moderator's prerogative. Kathy, if you don't mind taking that one. Um, I will. And uh, essentially the thermal, so the unfortunate thing is the answer is kind of long. And uh, <laughs> so, but the thing you need to think about is that the depths that we're talking about are actually not influenced by surface topography. That's, that's the short answer. So what we're, when we're going down three to four kilometers, uh, 500 meters or, you know, a thousand meters of relief actually do not have a significant impact. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, unfortunately, I see my clock saying 12.59. Uh, we, I think we booked an hour here. So uh, I, we've, we've come to the end of our really great discussion. This is, a, I knew this would happen. Uh, next time, we, we, I, I think we could fill three hours with this. Uh, thanks everyone to, for the questions. Fantastic questions that have been rolling in. And thanks, especially to our panelists for not only answering the questions live, but when I'm throwing at them, but answering the questions on the keyboard as you're throwing them at them. So, uh, I, I'm really seeing the, the possibilities of, of this format for webinars and, and I'm excited to do more. Uh, so thanks for this very enlightening discussion. I, I, I think like uh, the rest of you, I've heard a lot of about the activity and, uh, and a, lot of, um, a lot on the horizon for our region. I think we're really unfortunate, uh, really fortunate to have these uh, resources in Northwest Alberta. And by resources, I don't just mean what's down the holes. I mean, uh, 
also what you see in front of us and, and who I know we have in the audience. Uh, we, so we have this creative talent in our local communities. We have it in the college. We're, we're trying to build it in the college. Um, and with all the challenges of late, uh, you know, to get a little bit philosophical, I suppose, for Alberta, uh, I, still know, I think it's, it is time and, and, a, and a great time to come together on, on something as exciting and forward looking as this. And so uh, with all that in mind, um, if uh, I realize we've left a lot of things hanging here, um, lots of different directions these conversations go, I, I ask you to reach out to us, uh, either Terrapin or GPRC. Um, if you want a single point uh, as a quick, a quick email to remember, uh, research at gprc.av.ca, that comes to me, and I can forward questions to the panelists or wherever else they should go. Um, so uh, yeah, there we are, <laughs> out of time. Thanks very much, everyone. Mark, Kathy, Bob, thank you.